Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church. While well, we missed the snow last night, we'll let all those Lutherans out east get it, but we've got Groundhog's Day on Tuesday, so we're ready for some warmer weather here, aren't we? But it is good to be with you. I hope you're all dug out from that big snowstorm we had earlier this week. Uh, we are gathered today to, to hear from God's Word, uh, to rejoice and to praise the Eternal One, uh, to come together and follow Jesus Christ. I know we've got some people worshiping with us out in the parking lot again this morning. If you are worshiping with us in the parking lot, would you welcome us into worship by honking your horns this morning? All right, amen. I know we are also getting closer to somewhat normalcy with that the cases continuing to decrease here in the United States and Nebraska and the vaccine starting to roll out. I am just so very hopeful that, you know, soon this year we can pack these pews and then just get back to normalcy. But we continue on uh, being careful um, as we always have been. Just a few quick announcements. On February 17th, we will have our Ash Wednesday service. That service will be at 7 p.m. That is when we begin our Lenten season, February 17th, 7 p.m. here at church. We will be doing a midweek Lent service um, series. However, we are not going to have the meals along with that this year because of COVID. But we will have worship every Wednesday during Lent, 7 p.m. Um, the sermon series will be on the parables of Jesus. Jesus was a great storyteller. So we'll hear some of these parables as he teaches us about God and God's kingdom. Uh, so that'll be a good sermon series for you to participate in this Lent. Thirdly, um, many of you know Dan Mowinkle. Um, he was the ag teacher here at Logan View, as well as a softball coach, and did many, many things here in the community. You also probably know Dan has been fighting COVID. Um, as I understand, he is getting better. However, they are doing a fundraiser for Dan Mowinkle uh, February 24th. First is the fundraiser for him. Uh, the family's putting this together. What it is, it's going to be a drive-through kind of luncheon where they give sloppy joes and they're looking for free will donations to help offset a lot of the medical costs that uh, the Mo Winkle family has um, had to deal with. Uh, so please put that on your calendar. It is three Sundays from today, February 21st. And it'll be at the Euling Auditorium. And I believe it's from 10.30 to 2 or something like that. We do have a flyer um, on our bulletin board if you're interested in more information on that. Last but not least, we are looking for readers, lectors, to come up and read the first lesson, second lesson in Psalm. Um, if you would like to participate in that, we have a sign-up sheet going into the month of March. Uh, so please consider it if you can get up and, and just read a couple of Bible verses. We're just trying to get as many people involved in participating as we possibly can. Would you please rise if you're able as we sing our opening hymn, which is Rise, Shine, You People.
Come, let us give thanks to the Lord with our whole hearts. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Glory be to the one whose wonders are to be remembered. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Lord feeds the righteous with truth. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Come, let us give thanks to God. The one who pardons, heals, and strengthens all who repent, calls us to name our failings and our hopes. So let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy and all-powerful God, who commands all spirits, comforts those in distress, and casts out destructive forces, we confess that we are unable to do your will. We protect what is familiar and reject what is unknown. We admire those with courage, but excuse ourselves when we falter from the truth. We forget that you are always with us and that with you all things are possible. Forgive us, lead us, make us new. Remove our desire to heed false prophets, and show us your way. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Hear the good news. The God who made you and knows your every thought, hears you now and forgives you all of your sin. You have been redeemed through Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, who is Alpha and Omega, all in all. Amen. Amen. And let us pray. Almighty God, light from light, who commands the universe and all that is made, your word is the power that makes whole what is broken, the force of good, and the food of peace. Teach us now as you taught in the synagogue. Heal us now so that in all that we say and do, the freedom we have in you may be for others too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'll ask any boys or girls that might be in church this morning to come on up for our children's message. So come on up, kiddos.
Now, do you believe that? That if you really step on a crack, that your mom's back will get broken? What do you mean? Do you really believe that? No. No. That's just kind of a silly thing, right? But I want you to pretend again. Use your imagination. What if you had a friend who really believes that if you stepped on a crack, their mom's back to the break. What would you say to them? What would you do? What would you do if you had a friend that really believed that? I would laugh. You would laugh, all right. <laughs> no, no. You would do, like, you would call your dad and, like, hey, mom, back cracked. And, like, and, like, and, like, when he, and, and he didn't crack, he didn't crack. <laughs> so you could call your dad, right? <laughs>
Choose not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name. I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or presumes to speak in my name, a word that I have not commanded, that prophet sh shall die. Which, word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart and the assembly of the upright in, con in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, honored by all who delight in him. Majesty and splendor marks your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness, and justice for all of your precepts are sure. And they stand fast forever and ever, because they are done to truth and equity. You said redemption to your people and command, commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is, his, is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. A reading from 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. Now concerning food, sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father for whom all things and whom, for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things and all through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who think who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, no better off if we do. But take care of this weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, been ever been encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers in whom Christ died are destroyed. Their conscience is weak. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is caused cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you, Malachi, for reading this morning. Would you please rise, if you're able, for the reading of our Holy Gospel this morning. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. 
He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please remain standing as we sing, Just As I Am, without one plea. Morning. What 
a scene that must have been. Just to set the scene for us this morning, this is, this is early in Jesus' ministry. It's in Mark 1. This is really before he starts doing his miracles, before he starts teaching his parables. But he's in the town called Capernaum. And Capernaum's in the northern part of Israel. And Capernaum will almost be somewhat of a home base for Jesus and the disciples when they're in the northern region in Galilee. And it's the Sabbath. Now the Sabbath day for Jesus wasn't Sunday as we celebrate the Sabbath today, but the Sabbath during Jesus' time was on Saturday. You've got it. And it's a Saturday morning. And Jesus and his disciples, they're in the synagogue. They're there to worship God. And Jesus starts to get up. And he starts teaching. And he starts preaching. And I would have spent a million dollars to have been in that synagogue that morning. Can you imagine the different things that he was telling the people about? And all the people were amazed by his understanding and what he was able to talk to the people about God, he was teaching with an authority that scripture talks about that went far above the scribes and far beyond what any normal, ordinary human being would be able to do. In the middle of Jesus is teaching and preaching, though, in the synagogue, through the back door, walks this man. And the scriptures tell us this man has an unclean spirit. You might wonder, what is an unclean spirit? Is this the man who just had it showered in a couple days? Was he smelly? What was, what was it about this man? No, an unclean spirit is a demon. And we know that because other times in Scripture, when Jesus is talking and it talks about an unclean spirit, we know that this man is demon-possessed. And he walks through that back door. It had to have been terrifying. I'm sure everybody in the synagogue, everybody there that morning was terrified, frightened, as this man starts hollering out, what have you to do with us? So the man is speaking, and he has the demon inside of him. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Why are you here? Why are you bothering us? And Jesus, as he's being confronted by this man, demon-possessed, tells the man to be silent and commands that demon, that evil spirit, to come out of him. And Scripture talks about the spirit coming out of this man. And the man starts to convulse. He starts to cry out, screams as the spirit comes out of him. And he's healed. Talk about it. An experience. Talk about a moment that I'm sure everybody that was there never, ever forgot. And scripture makes it clear. From this moment on, Jesus and who he is, word starts to spread. That this man, this Jesus, he's different than any prophet, than any other person ever who walked this earth. A question I want to ask you, and really the focus of my message today. Do you believe this really happened. To get a little bit more specific, do you believe that that man who had this spirit inside of him was really demon-possessed? Or to really hit the nail on the head, do you believe in the devil? Because believe it or not, there are many Christians, many people of faith today that don't believe the devil exists. Or sure, they believe in God, they believe in Jesus, they believe in heaven, but the devil, demons, you know, we're too smart for that nowadays, aren't we? We've got too much intellect. We, we can't be fooled, we can't be bothered by things like that. I saw a recent study put out by the Barna Institute, and the Barna Institute is, is well-renowned for doing these different studies on faith, on Christianity. And this study just came out last year. And they asked a really simple question to Americans. This is just an American poll. Last year they asked Americans, is the devil real? And I've got four options up here. I just want you to put in your head 
What percent of Americans do you think believe in the devil? Is it 89%, 73%, 56%, or 42%? Now, believe it or not, the number of people who believe in the devil is 56%. 56%. Which means, if we round this, it's only about 50% of Americans believe in the devil. 50% of Americans believe in demons. Half of us think there is no force of evil out there. Half of us believe that the devil truly doesn't exist. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. This idea of being a person of faith and not having to believe in the devil really started about a hundred years ago, although you can maybe even go back further than that. Than that. But really about a hundred years ago, there was this, this new way of being Christian, teaching that you don't really have to believe in the devil in order to be a follower of Christ. This man up on the screen, his name is Rudolf Boltzmann. Boltzmann. And he's a Lutheran. He's one of us. He was a German Lutheran, and he, he taught and he preached in the early 1900s. So about 100 years ago, he went and he taught, and he, he taught in seminaries and taught all this business about Jesus and unclean spirits and the devil and encountering all these different things that we read about in Scripture. Well, you know, that's just myth. That didn't really happen. And nowadays we got to get rid of that. We got to stop talking about the devil because we know more than they knew back in Jesus's time. And I remember being in seminary and being kind of taught both sides of this. My, my seminary teaching didn't come down one way or the other, but it was just an option. You know, is this real or can we explain it, right? We know a lot more medically now than they did 2,000 years ago. We know about things like schizophrenia, or epilepsy, or drug addictions, all these things that we can begin to pinpoint what's going wrong in people's lives. And rather than really believing in demons, really believing in the devil, we, we can maybe start to understand, well, you know, maybe there's just something medically wrong with that man who walked in the synagogue. Maybe we can explain it using our best understandings. But here's the problem with that. If you are a Christian and you take that line of thinking, there is a deep and serious problem with that. Because Jesus didn't believe that. God's word takes the devil, takes the demons, takes the, the forces of evil in this world incredibly serious. And so if you're going to think that demons aren't real, the devil isn't, isn't real, then we can explain it. Well, you've got to stand against what Jesus taught, what Jesus believed, how Jesus lived his life. Jesus teaches, the Bible teaches us that the devil is real. Demons are real. And I'm convinced the devil's greatest trick, his greatest way of trapping us today is by making us believe that he doesn't exist. And the more people who don't believe in the devil, don't believe in demons, don't exist, the easier time Satan has getting into our lives. From the very get-go, this has been Satan's M.O. This has been the way he's tricked us as humans. You remember Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. What did he say to Eve? You know, did God really say that you can't eat from that apple? Did God really say you can't do that? You can eat from that fruit. Because when you do, you'll become like God. And of course you won't die. Just go ahead and do it. Satan, the evil one, is the great deceiver. We read about it in Isaiah, the 14th chapter, verse 12. It talks about the moment... That Satan became Satan because Satan was first an angel. He was created by God. But Isaiah 14, 12 talks about the moment of his downfall. How you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. This is talking about the devil. 
how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I will make myself the most high. You see, Satan wanted to rise above God. He could not stand that God had greater authority, greater power than him. And so the original fall, the reason Satan is who he is today, was his jealousy, was trying to ascend above heaven. Verse 15, though, tells us about his downfall. But you are brought down to Sheol. The Old Testament talks about Sheol. It's about hell. To the depths of the pit. Friends in Christ, when we talk about the devil, I'm convinced his greatest power today is convincing us that he doesn't exist. There are many people who don't like to talk about the devil, who don't like to talk about evil things because they, they think it makes them sound foolish. And, you know, talking about the devil, we don't like to do that. But Scripture talks about Satan being this angel of light. He's able to take these forms. He's able to fool us. He's able to convince us that he does not exist. My favorite, one of my great verses on this is from John's Gospel. It talks about there is no truth in Satan. Nothing he says, nothing he does is truth. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now what can we do? Pastor, if Satan is real, if demons are real, what can I do about it? Am I less unguarded? Absolutely not. For Lutherans, Martin Luther believed in the devil, and his his cause and his, his suggestion for how we attack the devil, I love this. He said, use music. Because Luther says Satan runs from gaiety. He runs from pride. He runs from being happy in life. And so Luther believed in these hymns. You know, almighty fortress, nice and peppy. You take pride and you sing hymns and the devil will free, flee from that. Or from Luke 10. Verse 19, hear this truth from Jesus. I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Did you hear that? Jesus has given you the power over all of the enemy and nothing, nothing will hurt you. One final Bible verse, one final just word of truth word of power. Here's the truth. Sometimes people think that somehow if we're not careful that a demon will just slip inside of us. That if we're not constantly on our guard that we can become demon possessed or something like that. Scripture never talks about that. That scripture talks about when you submit to God, when you follow God, when you read his word, when you devote your life to him, Satan will flee from you. There is no reason to be afraid of the devil. There's no reason to be afraid of demons when you follow Christ. James 4, 7 tells us Satan will flee from you. I'm going to close the message this morning um, with a message from someone that I know a lot of you knew a lot about. So maybe some of the younger people here never really got to know him, but Paul Harvey. You remember Paul Harvey? 1965, he had this amazing kind of message talking about, if I were the devil, what would I do? So I'm hoping it's going to work on the screen up here, but 1965, Paul Harvey, if I were the devil.
also have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves, until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I had mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect the discipline of emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug sniffing dogs and mental detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I had prisons overflowing, I had judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who want it until I could kill the incentive of the ambitious. What will you bet? I could get whole states to promote gambling as they wait to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public, and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Paul Hartley. Good day. Won't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we know that you are good. We know that you sent your Son into this world because you love us. But help us be on guard. Help us to realize that there is a force of evil out there, that the devil is real and he is out uh, to catch us. He's out to convince us that he's not real, and when he does that, he's able to gain control. Father, we pray for a special protection and blessing upon everybody that's here today. Um, keep our schools, keep our community, keep this congregation, keep our families, and keep our lives following you, following in your footsteps. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody say it along with me. Amen. Amen. Our service continues this morning with our offertory prayer found on page 7 of your bulletin. Do not let idols grow and multiply in your hands, but give of yourselves, your time, and your possessions out of love for this creation in honor toward what you have been given. Amen. Amen. Let us confess the Christian faith that we hold in common using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the needs of the world by saying, Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Holy God, we pray that you continue to be with all the medical workers and the hospitals and the nurses and the doctors and those caring and fighting against this COVID virus. Father, we pray that the vaccines that are being rolled out may do their work, that we may return to a life as we once enjoyed it. But we pray that you continue to lift up, strengthen all those that are continuing to, to fight in our, our, our health care workers. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy Father, we pray for those that are traveling on slick roads today and this week. We especially pray for those out east as they are getting 
of snow today. Uh, Father, we pray for steady feet, that there aren't any falls, any trips, any broken bones. So we just pray for your protection, Lord. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy God, we pray for our broken world. There's so much violence, so much turmoil. Every time we turn on the news, we are just reminded that this world is not the way you intended it to be. So help us to be those people that help to bring your kingdom here. Help us to be peacemakers, so that your, your kingdom and your truthfulness may truly come. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy God, we are very grateful for everybody that is here this morning. We are especially grateful for our guests and our visitors who are with us this morning. We pray that they may hear your word, that they may hear your truth, that they may go out into their, their lives filled with your goodness, filled with your light. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Finally, Heavenly Father, we pray for our schools, we pray for our teachers, for our school bus drivers, for the custodians. Uh, we pray for our students, that they may continue to learn, grow in wisdom, grow in maturity, um, and grow to be the people that you have intended them to be. We pray for protection upon our schools. We pray for um, good things to continue to be happening inside of those walls and every day. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Please rise if you're able, and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please remain standing. We are going to try once again a video hymn, a video song as we close out. Hopefully it will work better this week, but our sending hymn is amazing grace. So let us sing.
known by God, where there is fear, remember the authority of Christ Jesus. Where there is need of love, give it. Where there is pain, bring peace. For you are loved by the one who redeems, and free to live by the word of life. Go in peace with the knowledge that God's power is given to the church, the body of Christ, for the sake of the life of the world. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.